Our first scripture reading this morning is Psalm 146. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have being. Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man, in whom there is no help. When his breath departs, he returns to his earth. On that very day, his plans perish. Happy is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free, and the Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the sojourners. He upholds the widow and the fatherless, but the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever. Thy God, O Zion, to all generations. Praise the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. God. Last week in my sermon, I addressed the issue around John's language and use of the Jews. So for the rest of our season of John, I'm going to be following the suggestion of another Jewish colleague in altering the language to honor the text without doing additional harm in the reading of it. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged, and the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head and dressed him in purple robe. They kept coming up to him and saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again to them and said, Look, I'm bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him. Crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The religious leaders answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die, because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered the headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and the power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one that handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the religious leaders cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the religious leaders, here is your king. And they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but the emperor. And then he handed him over to them to be crucified. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. 
Thanks be to God. Will and I have enjoyed reading Harry Potter with Isaac a little bit each night. Now, I hadn't read any of the books until five years ago, and I did that because Valerie Kaur had just spoken. Um, I'd heard her for the second time at Montreat, this time with the college conference as her audience. Valerie's just a year younger than I am, but her resume and her list of accomplishments as a Sikh American woman are unbelievable. I could say a whole lot more, but I'll just say that the way that she talked about how Harry Potter inspired her, especially in the excruciating days following 9-11, finally inspired me to turn to those books in those very difficult days of early 2017. In those days, I was often up late and through the night with Micah and sometimes Isaac, And so the Kindle versions on my phone were easy to have at hand. And I read through the whole series in a month. (laughs) Now we're reading at a much slower pace. (laughs) Isaac doesn't know the whole story, and we're not reading at the kind of pace where we can quickly resolve the tensions that build over the series. I can't separate what I know from what we're reading But he can, and it completely changes the way that he enters the story. And I wonder, what if we could enter these stories with that same kind of innocence? What would it be like to have experienced all of this in real time? So I imagine being a child, maybe nine years old, a few years shy of the rites of adulthood during Jesus' day. Life wasn't easy, but your parents mostly shielded you from that as best as they could. You knew that they worried about the taxes that they couldn't pay and the delicate political realities of being a Jew in the Roman Empire. Most of the hushed conversations that you overheard were full of stress and worry And then a new character entered them. When your parents spoke to you and spoke to each other about Jesus, it was full of some new excitement. It was full of a hope that you hadn't even realized your parents had been lacking. And then one day you hear that Jesus is about to come near your town, and you ask if you can go and hear him teach. Along with everyone else, you were hooked on every single word coming from his mouth. But it's not just that, it's his presence. It's unlike anything you have ever encountered. You don't notice the time passing, and neither do others until the hunger starts to creep in. And your stomach starts growling, but you gladly offer Jesus the small meal that you packed a lunch packed with love by your mother and offered to this person who embodies love in a way that you've never experienced. And then you can't believe what happens next. Jesus feeds the entire crowd with leftovers with this little lunch. Wait until your mom hears about that. You're not the only one who's amazed. And in fact, you hear people around you talking, and some suggest that Jesus should be made a king. Could that happen? Wouldn't that solve so many problems for these people and problems for your parents? So you look around to see what his reaction is to this buzz, and you see that he has slipped away. Over the next few years, you try to see Jesus whenever you have a chance. You overhear what you can, more about the amazing things that he's doing. You even hear that he raised someone from the dead. You also know from the chatter that Jesus is getting into some hot water with the leaders, but you can't imagine after all that Jesus has done, after this person you've seen him to be, that he could ever be silenced. 
And then you and your family make the journey to Jerusalem for Passover. And along the way, you keep an ear to the ground. Has anyone seen Jesus? He'll be in Jerusalem, right? He, he wouldn't miss Passover in Jerusalem. And then you can hardly believe your luck when you see Jesus and his disciples going into the house right next to the one where you and your family are staying. Your family is busy with the preparations for Passover, and so you're able to slip away and find a perch where you can easily hear what's going on inside. You've heard Jesus before, but not like this. It's the most intimate and important teaching that you have ever heard. And it's all about love. And then they leave, and you keep following Jesus and his disciples at a little bit of a distance over to a garden. And suddenly the peace is disturbed by a whole cohort of soldiers who arrive to arrest him. And you continue to follow through the evening undetected. And it's brought you here to Pilate's headquarters. How can people be saying these things about Jesus? Why would they want to kill him? Surely all of this will get worked out. Even Pilate can't find a reason to condemn him. He'll be exonerated and released. And then Pilate has Jesus flogged. And almost in slow motion, you see these scenes unfold. A crown of thorns is forced on his head, and a royal robe covers his torn flesh, and the crowd is shouting for his death. And suddenly you feel your last meal start to come up. Because this can't be happening. It can't be. At any minute now, you're sure Jesus will shake off the robe and crown and regain control of the situation and all will be well. It has to be. Pilate asks the crowd, shall I crucify your king? And you remember when that crowd wanted to make Jesus a king. When they thought that he would deliver them from the emperor, but now you hear their response. We have no king but the emperor. You're stunned. Maybe you fall to the ground, tears streaming down your face, silently pleading to Jesus, Get up now. End this now. I know you can do it. All of the powers that be are against Jesus, and he seems to have no power at all, except the power to endure, the power to persist, the power to stay there in the pain and humiliation and then you notice something else. Pilate is terrified. This crowd is scared. Nothing that is done to Jesus can shake him. So who has the greater power? Jesus remains. He abides anchored in purpose and in mission and in love. And you see it in his eyes, that this is not the end. You don't know where the day will take you or how the weekend will end, but this can't be the end. In this scene, Jesus displays true power. His nonviolent response was a powerful form of resistance in the face of seemingly impenetrable powers. And aside from one statement, reminding Pilate that he has no power that God hasn't given to him, Jesus is silent. His stoicism and willingness to die demonstrate the ultimate emptiness of the powers of the state against him. What seem to be the most potent powers of our day? 
Violence and brute force seem impossible to overcome without taking up similar arms. Money and access to influence purchase power that is out of the reach to most of us. And we are all part of big, nameless, nearly invisible systems that seem so far beyond our power to change. Poverty is powerful. Addiction is powerful. Despair is powerful. Hate and fear are powerful. And all of those at times seem insurmountable. And many days it seems like they will win. And it's easy to lose faith. To decide that it's better to align with the stronger power. To proclaim that we have no king but the emperor. If you can't beat them, join them. The powers that be in our world are deadly and destructive, and yet we continue to give them life. But Jesus reminds us that true power comes from God and God alone, and that power is love. Throughout this gospel, John has in, Jesus has invited us to abide with him. And here in these last scenes, he abides with us. With the very worst of human powers and capabilities, in the depths of suffering and injustice, he abides and reminds us that the powers that be have no ultimate power that God will prevail. When it looks like things can't get any worse, when it feels like all of the bad in the world or in our world is beyond control, remember that we also do not know the end of the story. It might not be unfolding the way that we had expected or hoped, but God is still at the center. And whatever it is we go through, God is with us. And the story is not yet over. A young boy offered his lunch to Jesus. And what amazing things he witnessed. If he kept following Jesus to Pilate's headquarters, what he would have witnessed would have been devastating. But that wasn't the end of the story because the story continued to unfold in death and in resurrection. And as the story continued, he became part of the story. We too are part of that story. God took on human flesh to show us the depths of God's love for us. And Jesus willingly handed himself over to the powers of this world, proving that the power of God's love is far greater, that even a death sentence isn't the final word. Life is more powerful than death. Love is more powerful than hate. And the moral arc of this universe does indeed bend toward justice and the beloved kingdom of God. And as hopeless as things may sometimes seem, the story is not over. God is not yet done. Thanks be to God.